Good morning. It's great to see you here. We appreciate your coming to our session, and we especially welcome those of you online to our session. Um, with, as soon as we get it up on the screen here, you'll see that we're talking about the game of risk. Are you guys familiar with that board game risk? I'm going to start by asking you a few questions. If you had to describe risk in a word or a phrase, that board game, give me some, some thoughts. What, what kind of things would you say about risk? And for those of you online, type it in the chat, and I have someone that will, will read those off on the microphone for us. Anybody have a comment about the game of risk? What comes to mind? Excellent. Complicated, it's okay. Complicated. Anything else? Strategic. Strategic. Aren't these great words? Yes. Any, anybody else? Is it intuitive? Would you say? I mean, if you just picked up the game, would you need to read the rules? Would you need to know the rules to play it? You know, we're getting a lot of head shaking that it is not intuitive. It's right. not intuitive. Right. Okay. So, so you kind of see where we're going with this concept of the game of risk as we compare it to information security. Unfortunately, about this time last year, Lee Hyde realized or was told that we were, I think I have to stand back here, playing the wrong game. And I gave my wow away. We were playing the wrong game. Let me give you some background on that. Uh, our problem started in uh, about October 2012, when Zeus came to Lehigh. How many people remember Zeus? Well, Zeus came in October and stayed through November, December, January. Ren Isaacs was, was sending us emails every day, and it was just finding new places to crop up. In January, when it hit our advancement office and they lost a day's worth of work, it really came to a head. At that time, I wasn't part of information security. I was at Lehigh in identity and access management. But I was kind of drafted over to information security because obviously our security program was ineffective and asked to try to make this whole thing go away and respond to our administration about what's happening and what we're doing to fix it. I didn't have a security background, so it was quite a challenge for me. I felt quite overwhelmed. And so I did what I knew how to do. I pulled people together, experts together, to help me figure out what we would do called outside consultants and asked for their help. What do I do about Zeus? What does Zeus, you know, what can we do? Pulled together the experts at Lehigh in our IT. We, we actually met for the whole semester every two weeks with our networking guys, our system analysts, our enterprise system programmers, desktop support. We even invited outside of IT uh, risk our risk people, general counsel, and internal audit. We were trying to cover everything. I also joined Ren Isaac. Great, great thing. Uh, I highly recommend it. Was a great help to us. Took advantage of Educause. Came to the conference last year. Had a mentor. You know, took advantages of the resources. Uh, oh yes, and unfortunately, I had to look for a new information security officer, but in the long run, it was a great thing because we have Keith on board now. Um, and the fifth thing we did was we put an RFP out for um, a penetration testing and vulnerability assessment. So we did all this, and then the CIO asked me to put together a report uh, that would be shared with our administration, which was an instant response plus. Uh, what are you doing, that type of thing. And the president asked us to then take the report and meet with the audit committee of the board of trustees to go over this and to also create an executive summary that went to all the trustees. So we had become a very high-profile area 
of the university in just a few months. And so we went to the meeting in May. It was very intimidating. Much more people than are sitting here, believe it or not. We had the, inter, uh, the, audit, uh, the audit committee of the board, chairman of the board, president, provost, vice president of finance and administration. A lot of administrative people were in the room. And the CIO was to give the report. He barely got out one line until we were bombarded with questions about what are you doing? How are you handling this? You know, this is what we do in industry and so forth. It was quite, uh, quite uh, nerve-wracking to say the least. And I think some of you probably saw this very brilliant member of the board said to us, we, we see you're, very, you're doing a lot of things. It's great. We like that. However, you're attacking information security like a whack-a-mole. Wow! Think of that. Here I am thinking we're playing the game of risk, we're being strategic, it, you know, we have this complicated thing going, and, and all of a sudden he's telling me, you're playing whack-a-mole. Is that strategic? Is, is it complicated? Do you need to know the rules? I think you just take a mallet and go for it, right? That's what I, he was saying to us. And I think he was right. He asked us three questions. How are you prioritizing your initiatives? What data are you looking at? What data are you going to protect? What, what's, what's your big concern? And where are we at risk? Have you done an analysis? What are your strategies? Are you making the right strategies? Fortunately, as I said, Keith came on board July 1st. And with our experts and with Keith and all the input we've had, we put together uh, an answer to those questions because believe, it, believe me, we were asked to come back in October to address the questions. And we started with a secure framework where we're using the uh, SANS 20 critical controls, um, ISO 27002, and thirdly, we've been very, made ourselves very visible to the campus in outreach, communication, and of course, user awareness. The second question we addressed by really putting a bullseye on the data we were most concerned about. So we've, we've, we've identified that most restricted data, and that's where we would put our priorities. And third was our risk. On the quadrant of severity versus likelihood, unfortunately, we find ourselves in the top fourth quadrant because we found we are collecting and storing data on a large number of people, people that we don't need to be storing PII on anymore. And we're, we have it all over campus. People are writing reports with PII in it. They're, we're making clones of, of things and, and storing it and so forth. So of course, our goal is to reduce the number of people for which we, col we collect or store PII and also to reduce the number of locations. Is it necessary to store the, the social security number, that type of thing, so that eventually we can move down here? So Keith's going to uh, take over now to discuss how we're, re how we're trying to move ourselves from the fourth quadrant down to the first. Excuse me. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> yeah, it, uh, a bit of a complicated process when you're looking at uh, the, the whole idea and the game of risk. And, and it, uh, you know, we talked about it not being an intuitive game. Uh, and some of the things that you need to gather up are, are the rules. And in our case, in the case of uh, data reduction, uh, what we're looking to protect with the data, uh, we're looking at gathering the laws, regulations, looking at our assets and doing some valuation of risk. And I think the biggest thing that we found at Lehigh, and I think the thing that uh, we want to communicate to you folks, is uh, knowing something about the players. I mean, really pulling together the players. Uh, it was interesting that in the keynote uh, was talked about information security existing in that space, and, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, we have kind of infused ourselves in different spaces, I think, at Lehigh. Uh, in places that we, uh, information security did not exist before, and I think, I think it has added some value to the organization. 
A uh, chance for uh, some of the online folks and, and for you folks to participate if you'd like. Uh, just a, a little quick poll. Uh, I do ask the question, you know, since we talked about it a little bit, uh, what, game, uh, what game is your organization playing? Uh, and some of the responses I have here are whack-a-mole, it pops up, we chase. D does anybody feel like they're in that mode in the audience? Okay, that's good. Uh, war, you get some cards dealt and you just kind of go with the flow. Uh, shoots and ladders, up days, down days. Uh, Kerplunk or Jenga, everything's working fine as long as somebody doesn't pull out that one stick or block that causes a problem. Or are you at, you know, playing risk or strate stratego, a more strategic game, something where, you know, you've, you've got a handle on things and uh, you know what uh, is going on in your organization. I'll pull that down eventually. Uh, and, I, and I think those questions are questions that, you know, every organization should ask. And, th you know, this diagram is kind of to show uh, information security in the position of being the bridge, in being in that place, uh, the location between what I call the governance side of the house, uh, legal, uh, risk management, and I, and I put executives here, uh, although I would tell you that that's a whole host of uh, folks that might have demands for the data, not necessarily your data stewards, data users, entry people, uh, but folks in executive management, upper level management, maybe even faculty. Might be, uh, if you run a medical college, uh, it might be uh, doctors uh, or the medical staff uh, that fit into that role. And then the other side of things, uh, I've called them data users here because I think there's a transition from being a data user to being a good data steward, and, and we're going to talk about that here uh, with respect to records and records redaction, and the data custodians. And I would also tell you that data custodians is a higher level. Uh, you know, you have system administrators, network administrators. Do they make the transition to network custodians? And, and I think it's our, our job as information security folks to uh, bridge those, those two sides of the house. I also think it's, it's our responsibility to uh, make sure that folks are working within those, uh, I, I hate to call them silos, but amongst those groups as well. Uh, to give you just a couple quick examples, uh, we have information in information security uh, have been infused in the process uh, for reviewing uh, purchasing, uh, especially cloud service, uh, hosting, purchasing agreements, so legal, risk management, and purchasing, if you include purchasing in that group, are asking us for input when we go and start put data, uh, uh, organizations look to put data out in the cloud and uh, how it's protected. Over on the other side, between the data custodians and the data users, uh, we as information security, Sarah's been great about this, have been calling the data steward meetings uh, and um, have been directing uh, security initiatives through those meetings, but also the data users are bringing up functionality issues with things like our, our banner installation and whatnot. And, and really, it's not a game of uh, one side versus the other that we're trying to be the, the peacemaker between the two. It's really a game of risk where we're all trying to protect the same thing. We're all trying to protect that chunk of data, you know, the, 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 the information that we house that is, you know, the sensitive critical information. And the program that, you know, that we've been really pushing and taking out to our, the, these groups and communicating to these groups is this idea of uh, risk reduction uh, through remove, redact, and restrict. And that's, and that's really where we focus. Now, I, I'll end up visiting this slide a couple times or a slide like it um, because we really stress to those end user groups the idea of removing. Uh, the three R's has worked very, very, very good, well with, uh, in our, within our organization. And again, uh, I'll tell you that the object of the game is not uh, one side versus the other. It really ends up being, can we convert the different groups 
uh, from data hoarders to data stewards. Uh, the data users, can we partner with all those groups and have data users that you know, respond with, with, uh, properly with uh, records retention policies and that become good data stewards in our organization? And it didn't play. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and the process that, that we look at, the process that uh, I've looked at uh, to get there is uh, simply rock. And I've asked folks, you know, do, do you want to rock in your organization? And uh, the acronym standing for recruit, organize, communicate, and kickstart. And I'm going to really go through those phases as kind of a cookbook, if you will, to get your users, I think, from, from those data users uh, to, to data stewards when all is said and done. So the idea of recruiting the appropriate team members, again, that was something that was talked about in the keynote, and I think it's very important. And when I say organize, organize assets, what's most important to your organization, uh, organize policies, what should you take out uh, to, to, to communicate, and then the possible solutions, and then communicate those. I think uh, doing some homework to end up with some quick wins is important as, as well. So in the game of risk, we build armies. Uh, we end up you know, coming with a strategy where we want to attack the problem. And uh, again, looking at the two sides, uh, the governance side and I'll say the data use or utilization protection, you know, kind of the operations side of the house, uh, we as information security have gathered two teams. Uh, the first team we call the governance uh, team, the GRC team, uh, and the GRC team is made up of a representative from legal risk management and we have some faculty staff representatives. We have some executive representatives. Uh, it's designed really to, to look at policy and direction and, and compliance issues and then to be able to carry that water and communicate over to the other side to the, to the data users and, and data custodians and, and communicate some of those policy issues. Uh, so we meet. We have a representative group. Uh, we try to meet once a month. And, uh, and you know, raise some of those issues. And then uh, we have a data e-security committee where we test out uh, some of the solutions that we're seeking uh, to provide. They might be technical solutions. They might be, you know, will this policy work? And then we kind of carry those solutions uh, to, to more of a broader audience when we move on. Uh, to some of the other areas. Now, I will tell you some of the attributes that come into play. I, I, I'd like to ask the question, you know, and I have a poll after this, but how many folks here have dedicated legal counsel on their, at their university? Okay, we have about a show of about, I'll say, 30, 40% of hands. How many folks have dedicated risk management? Okay, it's about the same, maybe a slightly smaller group. And we are fortunate in that we have both, um, and both uh, continue to ask us from the information security side of things to uh, have input, as I said, in purchase, purchasing decisions. Um, with the risk management folks, we do have cyber insurance. I'll ask that question. How many colleges, universities have cyber insurance that are here? Okay, that's also about the same, about the same representation as uh, no amount of uh, risk management. Uh, just know there's a lot of uh, bang for the buck with the uh, cyber insurance. Uh, I'd mentioned this in a couple of presentations uh, yesterday. Uh, our particular insurer, Beasley, we do get uh, access to things like posters, policy templates, there's webinars, there's all kinds of great stuff. You know, similar to being involved in, in Ren Isaac. Uh, if your institution's purchasing cyber insurance, there's a good chance that there's a lot of free resources uh, available through that. So it's, it's something worth uh, taking advantage of. And again, you know, for anyone who would, if it eventually gets there, that's the fun of taking a chance with polling. Uh, for anyone who would like to respond, and I'll skip that. 
uh, the, I do do have an active poll uh, with some of the questions I asked here to kind of get a distribution of folks who have uh, uh, legal and risk management uh, on their team. The other thing I would tell you you want to do, uh, organize, uh, arm yourself with policies, especially the policies that are necessary to really make a difference, to enact some, some data reduction in your organization, to get away from the data hoarding. So, uh, you know, the game again comes down to the data hoarders versus, versus the data stewards, and we want to get them to the data stewards. And Sarah brought this up before. I, I don't care how you've classified your data. We can quibble all you want on this should be here or there. The bottom line is communicate that data classification policy out to your membership. Where can you store data? And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later when in, in the communicate, the sea of the rock, but, but you certainly want to be armed with your data classification and define data to the users that's important. You know, you want to you want to be armed with data classification, and you want them to be familiar with it as well. Uh, I usually start out those sessions by asking questions like, you know, you tell me what kind of data is sensitive, what kind of t data is breach notifiable, and and folks respond back. So I think they they get that uh, information. And the second, and and I think the thing area I'd like to focus is is data retention. Uh, we found in particular at, at Lehigh, um, the, uh, our legal department had vetted, uh, the trustees had approved a data retention policy. Uh, it was communicated out to the data stewards and, and those data users and custodians and said, basically, go to it. Here you go. Remove the data. Take care of it. There, you know, not, not a direction of the connection of how to, and again, I think that's a bridge you can, you can build. But you definitely want to be armed with your data retention policy. Now, how many folks in the audience have data retention policies at their university? Okay. All right. Uh, and and I'll, I'll tell you, if you don't, uh, or, or if you're just constructing one, uh, there are some resources I have actually here in the, in the links. I'm going to just open a couple. First off, uh, EDUCAUSE. Ah, oh, that's why, maybe. It's always nice when you lose your connection, and then I'll throw it up for everyone in the world to see. Really? Yes. Uh, and let me go back. Get there easier this way. Uh, Educause does have some uh, resources uh, on on their site. Uh, a collection in a library for data retention policies. It's always wonderful when things work great when you have them disconnected, and there we go. Uh, so there is a library of uh, data retention policies uh, on the EDUCAUSE site if you do a search for them. Uh, those are kind of nice. I, I'm going to tell you that one of the things that I, I have in the PowerPoint presentation here is a link. Uh, the American Institute of CPAs, and this may take just a second to load. Uh, in doing some research for data retention policies, now Lehigh had one, but again, how to best communicate that to the data stewards and the end users was, was very important to me. And when we're talking to finance and administration people, finance administration people just love when you're talking about finance and administration bodies that have you know, given some guidance to what they should do. Uh, and this document in particular, a practice aid for records, records retention, uh, I, I absolutely love. Um, it's not super long. It's actually a pretty quick read. And in particular, I think all I had to do, and I'm not expecting you to read here, uh, was really bring up two pages, which was pages five and six of this document. Uh, how is a records uh, retention strategy developed and some of the key components 
the whys and show that to them. And then some elements of a good policy. And I, I also like the section, how do I de develop my records retention policy? Uh, and there is, I'm going to tell you there is nothing here that uh, I would say is any different from a data retention policy versus, you know, the, the, this is designed for information security uh, uh, by the American Institute of CPAs. So this is, this is very well done. And again, kind of gives you a little bit of a connection to street cred, if you will, to, to your, uh, your data users from finance and administration. And last but not least, uh, I, I will hyperlink here just quickly to our data retention policy. Uh, you can look at other samples as well. I figured I'd th throw ours, ours up here. Uh, one of the things I think that is very important with a good data retention or records retention policy and is done here is, is kind of simple matrices for the departments um, to easily define what records that the particular department's responsible for and uh, what the, you know, record retention amounts for that data are, something that's very clearly defined. And if you're meeting, like I, I, would, I had met with athletics, if you're meeting with finance and administration, uh, take their sections and deliver them. Don't give them the whole document, you know, and say read or, hey, this is important. Give them the sections that are important uh, to them that match up with theirs. Um, just to, to plug another uh, uh, entity, I don't know if we have anybody from Cornell here in, in session, but Cornell has a policy, a uh, records retention policy that they have out on the web. And it's structured very much the same way. Uh, and, I, and I happen to like it a lot as well. So we, we definitely want to, uh, you know, be armed with our data retention policy, some clear goals for retention, uh, defined categories. We, we, we saw that as, as well. And again, I'm going to go back to this idea of uh, remove, redact, and restrict data. Um, and the C of the rock process communicate. So we went out communicating the three R's. And our first step, when I say communicate and I mean it, our first step is removal. Removal. I can't stress that enough. Removal. And I, I joke with our, our, uh, our folks in the, the administration, and I, you know, I, of all folks, I quote Miyagi from the Karate Kid, you know, best way to avoid punch, no be there. Best way to avoid breach, data, no be there. Okay. Do we need to collect it? Uh, do we have old data? Why are we keeping it? I mean, really ask those questions. And, and I, I'm going to tell you those questions go a long way because the uh, administrative folks, they, they do ask that of themselves. They do say, gee, really, you know, we've had this information, we've had this spreadsheet, we've had this report for, you know, it's sat, sat in, in a common drive for since 2006. Do we still need it? No. Get rid of it. You know, it's ways to reduce, you know, that, that risk. And that's what we're looking for. Yes, a question. I just want to second those remarks. We just went through a similar process at our institution. We discovered that our, um, you know, our campus card database uh, was retaining information going back many, many years. Uh, and the earlier records were still based on you know, social security number. And once we looked at that and people realized that's not a good thing, they were very cooperative in, in removing it. But had we not asked that question, they wouldn't necessarily have known that it was there. Likewise, our business intelligence warehouse, which is collecting data from repositories all, all over the campus, um, we recently got them to agree that, well, they really don't need the social security number included in that, in the delivery of that information, so. Yeah, and that's a, that, thank you. That's a fantastic conversation.
that you've had there too because do do we even need to do we need to keep it uh do we need even need to collect it um not too long ago, I had a discussion with our parking services, and to pay fines, they were going to allow outsiders to create an account to pay fines via credit card uh, and process the credit card through a third party. But the data they wanted to collect to create a unique user account was the driver's license. And I said, do we really, do you really need to collect driver's license? And, and when I pointed out that first, I said, you're collecting a breach notifiable item in the state of Pennsylvania, so, so if they enter it, great. But second, we have no ties to the you know, Pennsylvania or New Jersey Department of Motor Vehicles to validate whether that's a real number or not. So not only are we collecting data that's breach notifiable, but we have no way to validate whether it's correct or not. So why bother? You know, what else can we do? Oh, well, we can set it up that, you know, they can use their email or a unique email address. Great. That, that is not something that we're going to have to breach notify on. So getting involved in the process, too, of, of, of early on of removing that information, I think, I think is very, very important. And, and that's why I stress, stress the remove. I, I, it's interesting. I, I know a lot of folks in, you know, in a lot of presentations, and I'll, I'll be one here too, we, we end up quoting to, to our users because we're a university, that, you know, talking about the University of Maryland breach and the fact that they went through a records reduction afterwards that, that claimed to reduce records by 75%. So we want to be proactive. Uh, I actually use a, a much larger example. I don't know if folks are aware of the, the South Carolina Department of Revenue breach. But that, that breach was somewhere around 3.3 to 3.6 million records, most of which was supposed to be uh, record, uh, due to records retention expunged from the system. So uh, it's just, you know, you want to get rid of it. And the other thing that we tell the users, too, is that there's this fountain effect, this kind of waterfall effect. Uh, if we can remove the data and lessen the risk, we don't have to come in with that last item perhaps as vigorously and restrict access. I, I say restrict access. We still want to restrict access. But a lot of times, information technology, people want to apply technical solutions to restrict multi-factor authentication and, you know, let's, let's use some of the tools. And I'm not downplaying those. In fact, I'll talk about them later. Uh, but, but that should be our last line. That should be, you know, hey, the reason we end up talking about implementing greater restrictions and multi-factor authentication, some of the reasons, it, yes, is the importance of the data and the importance of the asset, but it's also the fact that, you know, that's, that seems to be the option that information technology has because we can't come to some agreement to remove and reduce the, the data and reduce the risk. So I, I think that becomes extremely important. So... Uh, again, I, I mentioned the, the South Carolina Department of Revenue. That, that uh, uh, little graphic actually hyperlinks to a description. Uh, some of the credit card information that was obtained in that breach was so old that the credit card companies didn't care. Um, it was, it was, the breach was 2013. The credit card information that was obtained was 2003 and prior. So they actually had credit card information stored in excess of 10 years. And it, you know, it's just, it just does not need to be there. The other thing I would tell you with communications, and, and we ourselves are, are working on this, I, I think um, I've seen a couple matrices of this. I, I could bring up Stanford's, uh, where they map where data can be stored based on its classification with the storage technologies that they provide. This is something that, that we're also working on as well. Uh, and that includes different on-site cloud services, et cetera. I think if you come to your users with that, because you're going to get asked the question, well, if I can't send it via, or I can't keep it stored on a common drive, or here, where can I put it? And you're going to get asked those questions. And we certainly did. So I, I will tell you, be prepared to answer them. The other thing uh, I will tell you is, uh, again, the two graphics uh, on this page, the cloud and the confidential, uh, we did develop a cloud storage policy, 
and a cloud services guide for vetting vendors for, for security, uh, for storage of data in the cloud. And our purchasing and legal departments uh, use those guides. And we try and put all purchasing agreements for uh, outsourcing through the review of legal purchasing, information security, and, and the cloud services guide. Um, you folks are you know, certainly welcome to to access those. I'm, I'm not sure which one I have first. Oh, I have the policy first. And the guide's kind of, I'll say the guide's actually longer than the, uh, than our policy, you know, where we, you know, tell purchasing to our purchasing folks to take a look at some specifics of access privileges, et cetera, when we're moving data out into the cloud. So we take a look at that as well. And, and I'm going to say again, you know, when we re finally reach restrict, we've probably reached the point uh, of, you know, last resort kind of thing. And, th and that's where, you know, applying some of the te technology solutions is, is a good thing. Um, the Online Trust Alliance, 76% of breaches. Uh, were the result of stolen account credentials, and we try and communicate that to our users as well. Again, some of the rationale for protecting their account credentials, we revisit phishing and the importance of that as well in protecting the data. But uh, again, that's all part of the communication process. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't have the, you know, what does it mean on a per record basis. Uh, the thing that we did find very important in communicating with our membership with the uh, $200 per record breach, and, and there's varying numbers on that. The thing we did found very, uh, find very effective was our cyber insurer does have a deductible, and communicating that, look, based on that, we're responsible for the first X amount of records, you know, as a deductible. So be aware, there's, there's a cost to this. It's not, oh, insurer covers this. <clears throat> Some of the ways that we do the outreach uh, with our membership, uh, meeting with the data stewards, users, we pitch the steps. You got to get out in front of folks. Uh, what I say here at doing your homework for quick wins um, is, is, is really kind of the next step. And the next step the, of the rock process, the K, is the kickstart process. Go for quick wins. Uh, again, as the information security group, if you will, the information security professionals making that bridge between compliance. Now now we need to talk to the data custodians. We need to talk to the data users. And we need to come up with some proposals. And that's what we've done at, at our meetings, come up with some proposals for some quick wins in data reduction. We have X amount of records that we found that are. Can we remove them? And we basically put it up like it's a, like it's a proposal for a vote, and and that's how we head to quick wins. So along the way, we propose some key targets uh, for data removal, and I think that's rather important. Don't just again ask them to go back and 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 you know pull their information out and do do all the work. Make some proposals. Um, ask your stewards. Yes, ask them to identify. Uh, you know, one of the things we found in the very first meeting was, yeah, you're proposing that we remove these records. That'll get you about, you know, a reduction of about 20,000 in places that, you know, you don't want it. But, gee, we have these test instances where we've replicated data, and we really aren't doing anything to protect that. And that came, you know, from, from one of our, uh, our, our DBA uh, folks. And, you know, here's some things we can do. Wow. All right. So our quick win was trumped by your quick win. And, and I look at that as, as extremely successful communication when we go there. We thought this was a good way to go. You thought differently. That's great. And then the, the thing you have to do, and again, I, I, it's not that, that I'm, I'm you know, saying that uh, you know, our legal department did any, in any way, shape, or form a bad job of communicating. but. You know, somebody coming back and, and seeing if it was complied, if the project was completed, if the data was successfully removed, monitoring and maintaining 
that and keeping momentum for other projects. So that's another spot where I think information security and, and the metrics and following up, what data were we able to remove and, and how did that go? So just a, a few quick win stories. Um, I, I actually don't have, uh, one of our initial quick win stories was not a large amount of records. We, we used a malware incident in the uh, provost's office to meet with the administrators of the provost's office and report on what we found had occurred and happened with, with the malware incident. It was CryptoLocker, and I think many of you are familiar with CryptoLocker. And after we covered, you know, what we did forensically and discovered with, you know, what occurred with CryptoLocker, you know, we started talking about, you know, their processes and simply asked the question, you know, here, here's the important data, you know, we didn't have any issues with, with this kind of sensitive data in, in this incident, perhaps, but, you know, what can you do to, to reduce, remove? And it was, it was kind of a nice joint application meeting. Uh, I sat, I've sat in many of them, and this was rather nice because the users just all kicked around. You know, yeah, we get applicants. We have social security numbers. We have them stored here. We don't need to send them, though, on. We can redact the data. We can... And they, and they solved, you know, some of our security issues by kicking that around and then reported back, you know, that they had, they had gone through that and done that with some of the image scans and, and some of the information that they had stored, which was an absolute win in, in so many ways. You know, not just the, the data reduction, which was not a tremendous amount of records, maybe 2,000, 3,000. Am I right on that, Sarah? Is that close? Uh, but... Uh, but just the fact that they were recognizing that that process could be changed was important. We met with our finance administration. Uh, the leaders there uh, actually had their folks go through and, and look at records for records reduction. They've come back to us now and, and asked us, can we run some of the technology scans, run some identity finder scans, or, you know, and, and look and see if they've missed anything. And, and I, again, I consider that a huge victory because that's the data stewards themselves taking a look. We don't need this data. Hey, can you give us some technology to take a look at what we missed and, you know, help us make decisions on that as well? So, so that, that's, that's kind of a nice uh, uh, full circle uh, as well. Uh, we've had some PII in more globally viewable locations. I don't say globally viewable, uh, certainly uh, to a greater audience of users uh, that we've reduced. And uh, again, the, the win of looking at uh, uh, duplicated data in test instances. You know, what can we do with uh, some of the test instances as well? And then, you know, as a, I'll say, a last resort kind of thing, you know, Deploy the technology. The interesting thing is versus telling users we're going to do it, uh, I thought the really cool thing with finance and administration was they were asking for it. Can we go the next step? Can we do some scans? And, I, and I, again, I think that's, that's, a, that's a big victory because they're, they're asking the process questions and then they're asking for the you know, technological oversight for, for some help. Uh, and whatever the tools are that you use, uh, there were a bunch, you know, a bunch of vendors here, uh, some which are represented up there. Oracle presentation I sat in on, if you know, like us, uh, Banner School, Oracle backend, data protection of you know some of the most critical assets. You know, can we deploy the technology now? And I could add an S to the rock, to rocks, and you know, the big thing is sustainability. Um, that, again, we don't just drop this in the lap of the end users, but we're able to revisit it, it create a, a repeatable process. So tell me if I'm on time. That's always nice to know. And then it won't shut up. That's even better. There we go. Finger doesn't work. Uh, review technology tools uh, for automating the process. Uh, again, you know, what can we bring in to, to keep this, uh, this momentum rolling? Uh, revisit timelines and record schedules. Uh, you know, uh, see, you know, we had 
every year you've got new applicants, so every year you're going to have data that actually can be expunged. If you have a five-year, six-year, two-year applicant uh, record retention policy, uh, that PII can be reduced uh, absolutely. And, and you know, make sure you report on results. Um, I tell Sarah all the time, this will be, you know, an effort that goes unnoticed except when we write up a report and, and submit it to, you know, uh, risk management so they can go get pricing on cyber insurance. What have you done the last year? I just uh, wrote that, uh, that paper for them to go out and get cyber insurance pricing. What types of things are programs or projects are you initiating? And handed that off to them. And hopefully next year we can give, you know, a little bit more of a detailed report and a report where, you know, here's, here's our records count this year, here's where we've worked at, at reducing records. So I think, I think that monitoring and feedback uh, is important as well. So I'll ask yet again uh, another online poll if you care to participate, but a poll in here. Uh, it, it, where would you say that your your folks exist? Uh, how many how many schools think we've they've got data hoarders? <laughs> how many schools think they've got somewhere in between? Yeah, we've got some data hoarders. We've got some. Okay, I, and you know I would tell you in those roles uh, identifying you know the, the those key areas. Sometimes it's it's going to have some great importance if if the data hoarding is occurring in your most prized asset, and and the numbers are very high, that might be extremely important. Anybody here who's winning winning the game of risk? How many data stewards? We've got it covered. Well, it's nice that you would attend. <laughs> Everyone, thank you, thank you. Um, any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll say yes in the in the departments that we asked to do it, but I'm going to tell you that uh, here's where we, we probably had greater success with paper records and, and doing the redaction than, than we did with uh, uh, our uh, data records. Um, again, that's that's another place where we're going to I think we're going to end up having to go visit uh, for a, a solution for those folks and offer it up that they, they might use it. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I understand that, you know, again, it's a kind of an extra step in the process. Um, we had uh, 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 the provost office in particular, uh, they were talking about sending out to mul multiple copies and they, were, they actually uh, removed the data because the end users they were sending to might be interviewing a candidate they didn't need to know the candidate's PII. So, so they, they were not redacting. They were actually removing the information. Anyone, I anyone think else? One of the, uh, the question that he asked was about redaction. And I think one of the problems we, we found that was interesting is, is, is you know, when uh, we were asked to remove Social Security numbers as our IDs, I'm sure all of you went through similar processes. We did it centrally. Banner now, you know, we have a Lehigh identification number and so forth. But what happened is the department still kept the same business practices. If they had wanted that Social Security number in 2005, they were still keeping that on their reports. Um, but one of the things I think we're challenged with, with redaction, of course, and, and Oracle has a, a type of redaction, ish, uh, redaction option in their uh, security options, is that uh, when we clone our test instances or our reporting instances of Banner, um, there needs to be some investment in doing that type of redaction where people can still run intelligent reports. And that's quite a challenge, and we're still uh, pushing to do that. So that has not been a win for us as far as the, the big, uh, most important data. Anyone else? Any from our online audience? 
I'd like to thank you for coming. Please, uh, if uh, there are any uh, individual questions we can answer, please stop to see us. Uh, contact information and be happy to give out cards and contact information. Uh, been a great group. Thanks for participating.